course, I would like to thank the 3S for uh, inviting me here. Uh, it's uh, very productive for me because, uh, because of this uh, mixture uh, from different communities, and I have already started a, a series of interesting discussions uh, with people from the other side, so to say. And now what I would like to, to, to give is a sort of an impression what we aim for and what we can do with these optimal control ideas, so where could we, we could use some of, for instance, simulation techniques that are being developed in, in some of the groups that are participating here. So <coughs> here is my favorite example of a, a non-trivial control task. Uh, <coughs> th this is a pre-Photoshop picture in the sense that this uh, uh, feature here was not added, so it was real. And even if, if I tried to perform such a task, even without the speed up device, I would fail miserably. So my fidelity would drop to the floor you know, by the time I reach the middle of the room. So I needed to learn how to do these things. And if you look how um, a real waiter does that, okay, he would not just do it adiabatically like this, because otherwise the champagne will be very warm by the time I reach the other end of the room. He would not just you know, do it quicker in the sense of just going fast like this with a linear ramp, because otherwise the fidelity will drop to the floor, but a real waiter will do the following a strongly non adiabatic process, excitation, and then de excitation. Okay? And this is exactly what I'm trying to, to do with optimal control if I'm trying to reach some non trivial task in time evolution uh, <coughs> of few body to many body quantum systems. So the point here is I want to control quantum systems, both closed and open. I will give a few examples. And then I want to push the limits. I want to put on my, my uh, skates in order to push the speed of my uh, processes and also the size controlling many body quantum systems. So <coughs> here is a couple words about controllability. Yesterday night, we had a problem with the uh, boat. Uh, whoever was on the boat remembers that there was a problem with the transverse parking. Okay? And this is a problem which is very common, at least in my country. Uh, and so I start with controllability, you know, like mentioning this type of, of problem. So is my system controllable? I sit in the boat or in a car for that matter and I need to park it transversely. And you know there is a parking theorem that says you can park a car or a boat transversely in a space which is epsilon longer than the boat or car itself by epsilon arbitrarily small quantity, right? <laughs> and so you sit in your, in your boat or in your car and you wonder what can I do, okay? And then, you know, of course, what do you do? You check your dynamical Lie algebra, right? You have a certain operations that you can do. You go back and forth, you can turn around, and then, <coughs> you know, you compose them, okay? So, <coughs> actually, you will be able to do that, but the question is, how long does it take? What are the limits for, for that, right? This is, of course, a classical example. Yesterday, we had really an experience directly of, of that, but, of course, there is also a quantum situation in which I may have some discrete states and I want to go from some initial state to some goal state in the end, right? And, you know, I can have some couplings that my Hamiltonian gives me, but they will not be sufficient in this case. So I needed to do something to my system to shake it, okay, to excite, to de-excite. So maybe with some lasers I create some additional couplings and then I will have some paths from initial to goal state, like this blue path or I can have a green path. But which one is the best? Which one is the optimal? This is the question that we are going to address and hopefully to solve here. So here is <coughs> um, a picture of um, a cartoon basically of this uh, you know, waiter example. How does it work? So if I want, let's imagine that I want to stay in the ground state of some you know, le time dependent energy level scheme and end up in the uh, ground state at the end. So what can I do? I can go adiabatically, as I said before, which would be, you know, I just go slowly and I stay close to the ground state, maybe with some little error. But of course, <coughs> I could also say I want to do it quicker, and the naive way would be just to shrink the time, but we know that, uh, you know, here around there is a landau Zener crossing, meaning that, uh, you know, there will be, if I do it fast but naively, just some excitation. Uh, my energy shots up. So what do I do? I excite maybe more in the beginning with optimal control, but then, you know, I let my system interfere back to its ground state, like I did with my champagne glasses. And <coughs> this seems uh, a cartoon, and one says, okay, will it work? And here's an example that it does work, in the sense that this is even a many-body system, uh, a spin system with all spins coupled to each other. This is the lipkin meshkov leak which is realized, for instance, in, in, uh, in, uh, with atoms in cavities. And there is a, uh, we did a calculation for the system, and, mm, system by Tilman Esslinger, in this case, that they are going to implement. And here you see in blue the level scheme for this system. And then the adiabatic curve is the yellow one at the bottom. If you just do naively some short curve, then you, uh, some short pulse, you just shoot up. If you do the green curve here, then you are going to 
you know, first excite a lot and then, you know, have uh, some complex dynamics and then you go basically across a gap in a quantum phase transition and you go back to the ground state, okay? And, <coughs> you know, maybe this is a special example, maybe this is pathological, so we wanted to investigate it a little bit more in general. So, let me uh, give you a few more examples. So, <coughs> we can do this with this uh, Lipkin model, the, the red symbols, we can also do some sort of, uh, you know, there, there are also uh, adiabatic quantum algorithms that, you know, work in a similar way. You have to adiabatically follow the evolution of some Hamiltonian system. Like here we analyzed a, an example with a the, with the Grover search algorithm, or you can just have a simple landau zener crossing. And, uh, you know, all of these things uh, collapse onto one another if I rescale the time as a function of some T star characteristic time for my system, Basically, the infidelity, the error that I make in my final projection onto the ground state as a function of the time scales in the very same way for all these systems. So there must be something physical in here. And in fact, we can define an action parameter, which is time, time the total time it takes for the, for the process times the, the um, uh, uh, gap for, the, for my um, many body model. And what we know from, you know, like school is this part below here. So if we have a linear ramp from one side to the other, of course, if it takes infinitely long time, so this action is infinite, the infidelity, the error, will go to zero because I can stay arbitrarily near to the ground state. And of course, I have a certain Fermi golden rule calculation that will tell me basically have around 100%, 100% error if I go very short. And there is a quantum speed limit that I will describe a little bit more in detail here in, in between, which is, I mean, it is not very clear what should happen here quantitatively. On the other hand, you know, if I use optimal control, I can reduce to identically zero the error for any time, just also strongly anti-adiabatic times, mm, shorter than adiabatic, for, you know, basically any time bigger than, than uh, the quantum speed limit, and then I have a universal scaling of this error that I'm making for smaller, times smaller than that. And we want to analyze this in a series of examples. So, <coughs> here it goes. Here is <coughs> uh, not only an o a closed quantum system, like the one I showed before, but we can do this even for open quantum systems. So here I have a system in contact with a reservoir, and again, what I want is I want to apply some control fields in order to reach some goal. I have some objective, and my control algorithm tells me how to change the control fields in order to achieve that object objective. And what I can do is I specify this to a harmonic oscillator, maybe parametrically driven, but I want something that is some sort of not, not just some, 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 some model bath. I really want a bath that, you know, can, can reproduce some physics like, you know, non-Markovian bath with some ohmic coupling up here with the spectral function. And I want to drive my system in order, for instance, to bring it from some thermal state so the bath can be in some, some high temperature state. I want to bring down the entropy, for instance, of the system. And here are some results. So if I... <coughs> Uh, do some, some simple uh, pulse uh, with no structure, you know, basically I do not obtain anything. If I do some pulse which is not taking into account Markovianity of my, uh, non-Markovianity of my, of my bath, the bath memory, then I get these uh, uh, red lines and again I am not getting anything very significant in the sense that the entropy down here for all the cases in which you know, I'm using rotating wave approximation, thereby um, treating the, the bath as Markovian. Basically, my entropy is going up. On the other hand, if I am really taking into account the non-Markovianity of my system, so really more exactly the dynamics, I get these more structured blue curves, and my entropy in, in my harmonic oscillator coupled to a bath that I am just massaging goes down. So I'm able, via optimal control, to pump entropy out of a system into a reservoir which is hotter than my system. Why that? Because I can have this interference effect between different states that I showed in my cartoon, and <coughs> using the memory of the, of the reservoir, I can be able you know, to exploit that in order to reach my desired goal. <coughs> so I can do some non-trivial things, let's say, or at least things that I would not expect uh, <coughs> naively from such systems, and now I want to start and push them. So first is I want to push to the quantum speed limit. And of course, <coughs> there is again a problem with um, car circulation 
that I know that, that I come from Italy, as you hear from my accent, and we have one mm, thing which is common between Italy, Germany, and also Russia, where I was recently, where I gave this talk recently in front of 15 million people. Uh, <coughs> no kidding. And uh, mm, there is, it, the uh, common thing is uh, irrelevance of speed limits. Uh, for different reasons, of course. In Germany, speed limits do not exist. This is guaranteed by constitution, right? <coughs> and uh, Mrs. Merkel will not touch speed limits because it is not in the government program. <coughs> in, on the other hand, in Russia, no one knows whether there are speed limits. <coughs> in Italy, perhaps they know, but I mean, it doesn't matter anyway. <coughs> so, <coughs> uh, but quantum mechanics is neither, well, of course, it is German, we know that. But nevertheless, quantum mechanics is a little bit more strict than German constitution on speed limits in the sense that uh, there are limits to the evolution of a quantum system that are dictated by fundamental laws. And here is, <coughs> if you would like, some very naive, simple time, uncertain, time energy uncertainty principle in the sense that the maximum speed with which I can go from one state to another state is uh, depending on some time scales that I have in my system. It is inverse on time scales, either the <coughs> average energy or the uh, average energy variance for my for my system. This is something that was proposed by Lloyd and co-workers almost 10 years ago, and now what we want to do is we want to investigate it <coughs> in a specific many-body system. And here is our model. We have a spin chain. <coughs> we have an initial state where we have a certain, you know, spin state, a superposition here on one end of the chain, and we want to transport it to the other end of the chain. Why is that relevant? This is relevant, for instance, in quantum communication or quantum information processing because they may have different regions of a quantum processor connected by a quantum wire, have a state which appears in some <coughs> place. And uh, Sugato Bose, 10 years ago, proposed a process in order to <coughs> use this, uh, this, uh, this channel to communicate and to transfer quantum states from one end to the other. And one possible embodiment of this is changing the, you know, having a modulated parabolic magnetic field that uh, is moved across and it is a little bit like my transport process, which is why I'm, I'm, <coughs> I'm using it here in, um, in this example. I'm transporting some excitation from one end to another of a chain. And so <coughs> if I try to do it adiabatically, of course, this will work easily in the sense that, you know, I just swap my excitation from one end to the other of my chain. But now, if I wanted to do it quicker or equivalently, same time but uh, lower uh, oscillator frequency, what will happen was, will be that I leave some of my champagne on the floor, as you can see, right? Because, uh, <coughs> I mean, I cannot carry, I'm going too fast, and so I cannot carry the system through all the, the crossings, and so the fidelity in the end is definitely smaller than what I, I, I would like in the ideal case. Now, if I want to do it quick, but using optimal control, what I can do is I can apply my optimal control algorithms and change, modulate, you know, wiggle around somehow the mm, frequency and the position of my, of my modulation in the field. And so if I do that, basically I get some wiggles in my, my control parameters. And what will happen after I have these wiggles is that I basically am juggling my system around. So I am delocalizing it, but still keeping it somehow uh, focused. And then I refocus it until... Um, the final point where I can reach my goal, you know, several uh, orders of magnitude faster than the adiabatic uh, strategy and with uh, very good fidelity. So now I want to know what is the limit for this. Because the theory of quantum speed limit, there is no clear and simple way to define a speed limit for this because it is a distributed system. So I need uh, three things. One is a computer. Second is a desk. Of course, I need a student and they need a chain to connect uh, the, the, the different objects uh, so that the student will be allowed from time to time to go maybe to the bathroom or, or to, to, to get some, some water, but then the student will be able to be freed only after he has completed uh, such a diagram. And this diagram is <coughs> a diagram in which every point in here is basically one of these um, you know, very time-consuming simulations of uh, my system so that I try to see what is the maximum fidelity that I can achieve with a chain of a certain length and after a certain time with, uh, for my process. And of course, if the time is long enough, I can see up here, you know, some high fidelity for my process. And if the time is short, of course, I get low fidelity. What is surprising is that there is a very large color scale here, but there is a very sharp transition here. It's like I'm hitting a wall, okay? And if I trust that my student, student was sweating enough in order to produce the best possible result, then I must say, okay, here is really a physical limit that I'm hitting. I cannot do better than that. And in fact, theoretically, it should be, the time should be of the order of, you know, n swaps through the chain. 
and <coughs> quantum speed limit optimal control allows me to reach this quantum speed limit. Not only that, it allows me to uh, somehow outperform it because this green curve would be really, you know, the um, a curve that uh, says what would happen according to naive estimate, uh, according to the simple theory that I showed before. And if I do really the simulation, I get something like this. I go a factor below that. And this factor, of course, is not revolutionary, okay? It's not, not, uh, it's not changing scaling of anything, but for an experimental group trying to do uh, experiments on something like this, a factor of a few um, units, and also knowing that they cannot do better than that, can be an important piece of information, especially if they are trying to, to really achieve a good performance in some quantum process. But that was, until now, was just an example. It was somehow, again, you know, trivial. You could interpret it in terms of this time energy uncertainty principle. So here comes something a little less trivial, which would be um, a situation in which I have an uncontrolled quantum register. So these qubits, I do not control. I cannot do anything to them. I can only change the magnetic field onto this qubit here. And <coughs> what I want is to do universal quantum computation, so two qubit gates, on each of these qubits here, on, on this whole register, and I want to do it with a sort of general uh, mod spin model, you know, a general class of, of uh, uh, potential spin models, where I only modulate the uh, magnetic field on the first spin here. So I'm wiggling one end of a, of a rope, and I want to do universal operations on, on that rope. Can I do that? What is the limit for this? Here it comes. Of course, the, the pulse shape is more complex. It is something like this um, that comes up here, but um, and nevertheless, the scaling is uh, something that is quadratic in terms of my, oops, sorry, I didn't mean that. The scaling, I said the scaling, come on. Yes, so the <coughs> scaling for my, not too much, ah. So the scaling of my timing is uh, somehow, as I said, quadratic in the length of, of my chain, of course, this time, because I have to do two operations, and so this is perfectly reasonable. Important thing, this is a polynomial scaling. So by just wiggling one end of this uncontrolled chain, I can do universal quantum computation, still preserving the exponential um, gain that I have with universal quantum computing. And this pulse seems very complicated, but if you look more in detail, you know, on the uh, sort of natural time scale of, of my system, which is inverse coupling between two sides, you will see that it has a structure that is not so crazy after all. So I can start wondering how much structure do I need to, to have in there? And that I can see if I am looking at the spectrum of such system. So here I up is the, uh, my, my spectrum where, you know, I have only a few frequency components and I, and I can start, you know, I go to an experimentalist and the experimentalist says, say, I have a nice pulse, please implement it. They start, what do experimentalists do? They complain, right? So they start complaining, oh, no, but my system is not, oh, but it is too ideal and so on and so forth. Uh, I cannot modulate so much. So I can I'll say, okay, let's take away, you know, frequency components. Let's filter out, and this is here, let's cut off most of that spectrum down to basic, basically below the natural uh, time energy scale for my system. And still, I get, uh, with, uh, you know, very reduced number of frequency components, I get just fidelity one. So only few frequencies are needed for controlling in such non-trivial way my system. And so I may try to use this idea in order to go one step further in the last 10 minutes of my talk, pushing the limits in terms of size of my system, not just uh, speed, but also size. And here we had a problem because we invented a new quantum algorithm, a new quantum optimization algorithm, and so we had to compete with NMR people because NMR people are very smart and they come up with fantastic names for their algorithms and acronyms, okay? So we thought hard. And we came up with something which was uh, um, for us satisfactory, but we didn't think of that we are in Germany and pronunciation is a problem. So <coughs> there is a problem here because this is the Krabb algorithm, okay? And <coughs> I hope that you will uh, preserve that. Sometimes when I hear some colleagues citing that, I mean, this uh, doesn't sound so, so good. But anyway, let me <coughs> explain how it works. The question is, how big of a quantum system can I drive? And this will be the only existing um, example of an optimization algorithm that can optimize a quantum phase transition with a many-body system. So how does it work? Again, I start with some uh, initial guess for my time dependence of some parameters that I, I want to modulate in order to achieve some, some, some goal. And <coughs> what I want is somehow to, you know, not just, uh, you know, optimize and look in, in the whole infinite dimensional space for 
uh, this function, but I want to, you know, mm, develop it mm, in a series of a few basis functions, which can even be randomized, so that in the end I have, it could be, you know, mm, uh, Fourier components, polynomes, whatever is, is more convenient, <coughs> and I end up by uh, optimizing and changing my pulse in time based on just a few parameters, a few control parameters, which are my A, K here. Uh, and so the problem drastically simplifies in such a way that I can um, have something like this. I have some, what we call an optimization landscape, so my figure of merit is depending on a few parameters, so it gives me a landscape, and maybe I start with my start um, pulse, you know, some way up there, and I want to go down because I want to minimize the error. So basically, I, I draw a little polytope there, and I let it roll down, okay, downhill, until it reaches uh, somehow uh, um, a different shape, and this shape is prescribed because there are only the frequency components that I want them to be. So it is not a kind of crazy pulse that comes out, but uh, this is something that does not require any complex uh, um, gradient uh, for calculation, doesn't need any analytical solutions, can optimize any figure of merit, fidelity, entanglement, mm, energy, whatever, and also can be embodied in incorporated in an experimental procedure. And I will show uh, to you all of that. Of course, <coughs> we want to convince people that it works, so we pick one of the uh, favorite uh, phase transitions in atomic physics with applications to quantum information, which is the bose abbard uh, mott insulator superfluid transition. And this is, uh, you know, described by, the, by a bose abbard model that was described uh, in previous talks. And here our process is we start with a superfluid with basically no uh, po periodic potential underneath. And then we want to ramp up this periodic potential until we get to a situation in which we, <coughs> we are in the, the mod phase so that we have maybe possibly some defects that we want to suppress. So we don't want a situation like this in which I have two atoms here and zero atoms there, but I want to correct for that. And <coughs> with my uh, optimization algorithm, I want to reach a goal, which is this perfect mod insulator state. Can I do that? Well, I can run my uh, CRAB algorithm, and so I get <coughs> my um, some pulse. I start with a linear ramp. Now, the duration of this ramp is almost two orders of magnitude shorter than what it typically is done in, in such experiments, and <coughs> we simulate it with, uh, you know, uh, 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 several tens of, of um, atoms in the, in the lattice, and the ramp that we get in the end is something like this, okay, which is nothing particularly fancy, but you wouldn't be able to design it exactly by hand, and you can see that somehow it slows down, you know, across the transition, like you, uh, you know, would expect uh, intuitively, but if you try to do it intuitively, somehow it would not be possible just to design it analytically uh, with the fidelities that this thing gives, because on such a time scale, if you use any of the pulses that are being used in current experiments with uh, such mod insulator transition, you get a density of defects uh, of doublons and holons uh, in, in the language that uh, Hans Christoph was using yesterday, mm, you know, above 10%. And if you use our um, method, you uh, go down by two orders of magnitude in, in defect density. And these are calculations which have been doing, which we have been doing with the, the green is with the homogeneous system, and uh, uh, the other one with the group, uh, um, with the potential used in the in the Tilman Esslinger experiment. And both of them, you know, give this uh, very significant improvement there. So <coughs> we are now starting to apply these ideas to you know other uh, situations including, you know, this was open <coughs> loop for the moment, like I do the math and then I go to the experimentalist and then <coughs> they, will, um, they will do the, the, the experiment. But now I want also to do this uh, in a feedback loop in an experiment. So <coughs> basically the, the idea is I can use this algorithm to give real-time feedback. I do an experiment with a certain trial function, I measure and then I improve that. And <coughs> the experiment uh, that I'm, uh, I'm, being, uh, I'm going to show here uh, is being done in Florence, in the group of Massimo and Guscio. And here is the first evidence that uh, it, it's very recent. It is unpublished, so we, um, we just got it a few weeks ago, where you can see, starting from the yellow region, you know, the, the really the measurements converging in down into the, the region of lowest errors. And we are trying to, mm, to, we are working on improving that, and this can be applied to, you know, a broad range of experiments. And this is on, <coughs> uh, so here the, 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 the timing 
this, this diagram is for the different you know, time scales of, of, the, of the pulse, so the two parameters in my CRAB algorithm. And <coughs> somehow what they, they managed to do is already to reduce by a significant factor uh, of um, you know, around four or five the time that they, it takes for them to do this mot insulator transition. And we are working, we expect to be able to, to reduce it by more than one order of magnitude uh, still. So there are other experiments being uh, performed in, um, uh, or planned in different groups with uh, the calculations that we provided here. Uh, so we are, we are starting collaboration with different experimental groups. And here is one big reason for my interest of being here, both in terms of uh, you know, exchanging views with experimentalists for different um, you know, kind of control processes that people might want to do, and also for exchanging um, techniques with different theory groups in order to be able to simulate more and more precisely, for instance, dynamics of, of uh, many atom systems in um, atomic interferometers, for instance, for the purpose of reaching some of these uh, goals. So, until now, this was a sort of service to experimentalists. Now I have, in my last couple of minutes, I have <coughs> one slide about some maybe more visionary um, process that we have here, which is the following. Let's say I have a piece of metal, a piece of material, and I have no idea about the Hamiltonian, and I have no idea about the eigenstates, and I wanted to produce some entanglement in there. Now, where do I find entanglement? I know that I will find entanglement in eigenstates, in energy eigenstates of my system. How can I know that I have an energy eigenstate without measuring, uh, without knowing the, the spectrum? I can measure energy fluctuations. So what I can do is I can give to my CRAB algorithm energy fluctuations to minimize as a goal, and then I am somehow ensured that after a certain modulation of an external field here, magnetic field for instance, I end up in some eigenstate which <coughs> will be then stable with respect to noise because if I'm in an eigenstate, energy fluctuations can, if it is protected by a gap, energy fluctuations will be able to do little to it. So here is a simulation that we did. Of course, in a, in a real situation, you would just <coughs> apply the, the experimental version of, of this algorithm um, in order to minimize such fluctuations. And here is the result that shows you that I can produce uh, an entangled eigenstate of my many body system. This is again in the Lipkin model. Uh, and if I suppress energy fluctuations as my goal, then and I can then introduce noise and entanglement stays, survives for, for long time. And if I don't do that, it decays back uh, immediately. So this is what we called <coughs> an entanglement storage unit, so to say. And this is really something that uh, you cannot even imagine without uh, su such uh, control techniques. And we are looking for you know, further applications you know, of more fundamental nature, not just technical, of these ideas. And with this, I guess that since it is 9.30, I am at the end of my talk. So <coughs> the first conclusion that I hope uh, I, I've conveyed here is that if I wonder whether a certain process can take place, I can use controllability theory to, to know that. I have to park my atom, and then uh, I, I look at my dynamical algebra, and I will know whether this happens. If I want to know how quickly this can happen, I look at the quantum speed limit, and this can be very relevant for experiments. If Instead, I want to really know how to do it. I need to use some of these wiggles, these modulations, by a quantum optimal control. And very proudly, I have been presenting you that we have the first uh, uh, instance of a quantum optimization algorithm that can deal with quantum anybody systems and quantum phase transitions. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you.